Welcome back to our tour of the M5A1. I've been invited out to the Rock Island Auction Company. They're basically flogging this thing in a couple of weeks. And I thought there would be good publicity for them, and this is a good opportunity for us to actually cover the vehicle. So, hey, everybody's a winner. Anyway, so now I've come in, I'm on the TC side. Now, bear in mind, this turret ring is all of 46 and 3 quarter inches. Uh, it ain't big. And even with just a two-man crew, this is quite cramped. TC on the right, he also gets to double as the loader as a result. Now, as I mentioned, just uh, above me, where I do go down a little bit more in this seat that raises and lowers, it does lower a bit, but frankly, my legs don't have any more room. Uh, there is that rotating periscope I'd mentioned before. There is another one directly to his front, uh, which also elevates as well as traversing. Fantastic. So the TC has reasonable observation. Now what he can do is he can actually lift the chair even higher and he can sit down comfortably with the hatch open and his head out and he will be at, you know, we call it eyeball defilade, which is exactly what I'm at right now where you can see that the only thing that is exposed is from here up. Much less chance of getting hit by something hot and nasty. Controls, well, to his rear is the bustle into which the radio would be mounted. To his front, he has a couple of options. One is he has a little handheld device here. This is the pistol grip for the spotlight. Now, I had mentioned the spotlight is ordinarily mounted on top of the uh, turret. Uh, but it can be dismounted. You can hand it, uh, handhold it with the power cable, and you can light up whatever it is that you need lighting up. Turret traverse lock is also to the front of the TC. To his front, a simple mechanical connection to the traverse control. This is the commander's override. This little drop-down hatch here is suitable for sticking signal flags up if you had a desire to do so. Light a little bit further forward. This bulky thing here is the oil reservoir for the a stabilizer system, of course, being an American vehicle, it did come with a stabilizer. And sometimes the troops even used it. He has, as the loader, of course, to load all the ammunition. There's 123 rounds of 37 millimeter scattered around here. 13 of which are stowed nose down in the ready bin in the turret, and the rest are in two large containers uh, outside of the turret basket in the whole sides, kind of to the left and right quarters of the turret basket ar area. You also have an additional 7,000 rounds of caliber 30 to play with for the coaxial machine gun, which also is a responsibility of the commander here. His top 30 and the bow gunner's 30, all three of them together. Gunner seat on the other side is, I'm trying to think of the right word, but awful, it's pretty close. I don't know if it's quite as bad as Sentinel, but it, it's really getting up there. Uh, oh, incidentally, these little handles here, these are what lock the hatch into place. I am sitting again on a raising and lowering seat, and yeah, my feet are within the turret basket, so they will not get chopped off, but it also means that I have no room for anything whatsoever. My right leg is hard up against the manual elevation. No chance I can operate this whatsoever with my head down. Uh, if I'm sitting up, then fantastic, but it's obviously pretty pointless. Because if I am sticking my head up, I have a choice between either hip shooting the 37 uh, or getting down and using the sights. Now, I have a two sights supposedly to choose from. The primary is missing. It's an M4A1 periscope with an integrated M40 telescope, which is you know, beyond the right hand side. Uh, the telescope is a by 1.44, and the theory behind it is that if it's going, uh, you're bouncing around with the stabilizer on, a low mag, you're still going to probably be able to see where the target is as you're bouncing around. It is physically connected by way of a linkage uh, to the gun, so as the gun elevates and depresses, well, so too will the sight. The alternate sight is the M70D. Uh, this is a simple telescope, it's a by 3 optic, and the manual is very proud of the fact that it's got a very small objective lens at the far end to keep the hole in the mantlet smaller than it would otherwise need to be. And in fact, that still looks like a pretty big hole to me, uh, but I guess what you're used to. Controls. On the left-hand side would be the handle for the power traverse, a full 360 in 15 seconds. Just above it, this is your control box for the stabilization system. 
Elevation, as I say, is manual. There is a manual traverse located to the rear with a selector between manual or powered mode. Elevation, 20 degrees, depression is 12. The gun, the 37 millimeter M6, not particularly anything unusual about it at all. Uh, it is a rifled gun that shoots 37 millimeter rounds. The APC round was rated to do about 2.1 inches at 500 yards, so you're not really going to be taking on main battle tanks with this with any great regularity. Although I have seen in the archives a discussion of an entire company of stewards that hounded a tiger to death. And they were very specific about it, but anyway, they say it took a while. I believe it. Eventually something went through. The Golden BB, they call it. The auxiliary motor is located behind them, and there's a very simple start button, and that's it. And also in the bulkheads in the rear, you'll see the access ports for the hydromatic transmissions. You do see that the 37 has an internal travel lock as well, just to keep the system stable as you're bouncing around cross country. Uh, there is another light, um, nothing much else to be said. I am going to get out of here and go into the hull because I have driven one of these things before and I know it's a lot better than this turret is. So sure enough, the bow gunner's position is substantially better. Now it may not look it because of the bizarre camera angle and the angle of my head, but the reason we've done this is directly in between where the cameraman is sitting, uh, I borrowed him from Rock Island Auction Company, uh, and where I am is the blower with the air vents and it just completely blocks it. So this is the best thing we're gonna be able to get to do. Uh, for the bow gunner, as I say, life is simple. He has an adjustable chair, the Caliber 30 1919A4 is the fourth one, aimed by tracer only through the periscope, which drops down from the hatch above him. Or, if necessary, there is that uh, emergency knockout plug, which I had mentioned before. He is also the assistant driver. He has a set of controls. The steering and brake handles are, as they are on the driver's side, mounted on the ceiling which is rather efficient use of space. And because these also work as the brakes and there is an automatic transmission, he only needs one pedal. And that is located right in the middle by his feet, where you would probably expect the pedal to be. Uh, to his front, uh, you can see the drive shaft, which goes from the control diff to the final drive. It's shrouded in, uh, in a protective casing, so his legs aren't gonna get caught up and turned into mush. Behind them is the escape hatch. It's, it's a reasonable size, but the same size as the hatch above. On the right-hand side to his rear is going to be ammunition boxes for the caliber 30. And between him and the driver, in addition to the aforementioned air vent, is the transfer case. The transfer case performs a couple of functions. Firstly, it combines the two power outputs of the hydromatic transmissions into one single output, which goes to the control diff so named because it controls not only the differential functions but also the steering. It also performs the act of range selection, so there's a low range and a driving range, which combined with the gears in the transmission system basically means you've got six speeds that you can play with. Maintenance, well, I mean, at least it's easy to do top-offs and whatever. Basic maintenance has to be done every 250 miles, but 3,000 miles seems to be the, the big one, both in the hydromatic and the transfer case and the diffs. All the bands have to be adjusted and tightened. You can pull it apart. Um, however, the good news is that most tanks didn't actually have to go 3,000 miles because, well, in the Pacific, the ships would take you most of the way, and in the European theater, you draw a 3,000 mile circle from Normandy and you're, you're pretty much most of the way to Moscow if not actually there. So, there you go, American reliability. And I am gonna hop over to the driver's side. Life is great for the driver. I guess it's good to be one of the lower ranking lads sometimes. He has a seat which will adjust all of three inches forwards and backwards and nine inches up or down uh, for open hatch or closed hatch operations. Again, for open hatch operations, he does have that windshield. It's very simple clips. Uh, it's, it's a very nice design actually. And it even comes with a wiper uh, cable, so you can come down and you place it into the receptacle for power, and you get, uh, you know, your wipers will work as you're driving along. Fantastic. However, the standard way of driving around in this vehicle is not with the hatch open, and it's with the hatch closed. And it's actually fairly simple. Pull down, and there we go. 
locks into place with a, a simple latch here and you're done. So you're now driving around with your periscope which for some reason if you wanted to look around one way or the other you can adjust in azimuth as well as in elevation. Again his feet, well he's only got one pedal to worry about so he's got a fair bit of leg room. Uh, handles, control handles of course as I say come down from the ceiling. These are also your parking brakes so if I pull back to release the tension I can release the latch and parking brakes are now released and you are now steering in your normal manner both to stop and then you set your parking brake again and we're good to go. There is of course finally the option of the knockout port just as on the bow gunner side. For the systems that he has, well, master power is over his left shoulder together with the battery. To his front, the dash is simple and laid out, and this looks a heck of a lot like what we saw on the M24 and the M37. Two rev counters, two ignitions, two starters, two oil pressures, two of everything because he got two of everything. When you want to get going, well, of course, first you want to make sure your transmission's in neutral and you turn on your two ignitions. The manual is very specific again just like the M24 both engines be started at once and again the question is why but there you go. The engines can be started by towing at all of four miles an hour but in the event that you have a dead engine something that's missing on this vehicle because I hadn't gotten around to thinking about it yet is the rapid disconnect clutch. So if you recall on the M24 you simply have this handle that will disconnect the drivetrain from the transmission. Not so in the steward. If you have a dead engine, what you have to do is just behind the transfer case is the universal joint, and you have to disconnect the universal joint, take it apart basically, and there is your disconnect. So a little inconvenient, but they learned over time and it got better. Now when you disconnected the prop shaft for one of the engines, the manual states that you have to cover the intake for that engine with a canvas or blanket or tarp or something, although it doesn't say why. Because it has an automatic choke, you don't have to worry about any settings. You simply depress the accelerator a quarter of the way and start the ignition. You know, your engine should spring to life. Once you're happy with all your pressure and your lights and there's nothing going wrong, nobody's yelling at you, put it into drive and away you go. Again, this is an automatic transmission, which means that it's very easy for even a new driver who never operated vehicles before to get a lot out of his vehicle. When you're driving around, you can use the transmissions as a sort of an engine brake. You put it into low, that maxes it out at second gear. So when you're going downhill, it'll slow down. Now, that said, just because you put it into low doesn't mean that it's immediately going to change. It will only downshift when it goes slowly enough that the gear change is appropriate. When you're done driving, simply let it idle for a few minutes and switch it off. Not a problem at all. You will see that there is a steering compass to its front. And yes, you can have one in a metal tank. It just has to be calibrated right. I think I might have mentioned that before. And of course, he has this lovely vent which is aimed right at him and will be very handy in days like today where, as you can see from the sweat, it's, it's actually not the coolest day here in Illinois. Fire extinguisher will be mounted to his right, and uh, that's about it. If he has to get out in a hurry, well, he's got the basket behind him. If the gun is facing the right direction, he can get out that way. There is the escape hatch uh, underneath the bow gunner seat. So that is uh, that is basically it. So with not much else to say, oh bugger, the tank's on fire. In total, 6,810 of the M5s were built. The vast majority were retained for US use. The UK got 1,131. They were known as the Stuart 6. France got 226. After the war, they would see service in all sorts of secondary theaters. You never know where one would turn them up. The major derivative was the M8 General Scott, the Howitzer motor carriage. In recent years, though, with the removal from service in other nations, uh, M5s and also M3s, incidentally, you started cropping up for sale for the collector's market. 
And this has been a bit of a boon because this thing is small enough that it's actually reasonable to fit in your garage, at least if you've got a reasonable sized garage. It's appropriate for World War II reenactment. It's actually pretty light on gas. It's easy to maintain with those V8 engines. And it's easy to transport around. So as a result, there's been quite a fairly high demand for them ever since. So I'd be curious to see what this thing went for. Once, uh, once the auction's over, I'll see if I can make a little addition to the text and let you know what the sales price was for your very own M5A1. Anyway, I hope you found it interesting and informative as ever. I'll see you on the next one. So, with not much else to say, oh bugger, the tank's on fire. Ha! Huh. I forgot about that. Your mic? Yeah. In July of 1941, there was... Uh, three, two... In July of... Not even July. Was it July? Yeah. In 1941, with production of the M3... Uh, damn it, rings.